so this is part of the of the uh, Anori Forum in the US Canada. So we are done events in Duke, Montreal, New York, and now here. Uh, Broadway is one of the associated partners of Metabody. So I really want to thank Lisa for, for facilitating all this being such a great hostess. So for those of you who aren't quite aware uh, of the Metabody, just a few words. Uh, Metabody is uh, a European cultural project. It's a five years uh, project which started in July 2013. So we still have more than three years to go. Um, it's a project which is about researching uh, into ways of involving the body and embodiment in uh, its full, uh, let's say, infinite spectrum of uh, richness, uh, of expressions uh, and dimensions, as opposed to the, what I see as a dominant tendency currently in information technologies to reduce that spectrum to the number of uh, largely standardized uh, processes, which is also what I see as the fundamental core aspect of a surveillance and control society. So we'll, we'll dig into some of these issues. Um, and this relates, of course, to the title that I proposed for the forum, which is Reversing Cybernetics, Queer and Control, Media Embodiment and the Politics of Indeterminacy. It's a very Tensious title. Please don't, don't, don't think that we are claiming to have reversed cybernetics, nor be reversing it. We're just asking maybe whether or how this might be desirable or possible. So, these are just said. Uh, it's important to note that one of the big outcomes of the project is uh, going to be an interactive architecture which will tour throughout the nine European cities of the project and hopefully then afterwards maybe here or other places. Now why? Uh, Metabody itself points to the, the idea of the body as always expanded, as never finishing in, a, in a skin, as, in, as never finishing in whatever we have learned, uh, that the body is supposed to be a uh, material entity. It's uh, redefining the body as a uh, it's a process, it's a field of forces that is always in between the categories we have learned, that is always exceeding those categories, that is always in becoming, and that is always expanded in, in infinite uh, varieties of ways. Uh, an important one being architecture. So architecture being part of the body, the, part, the body being part of the architecture. Um, but more importantly even, we want to challenge the idea of space as given this Cartesian res extensa, this immoral space that we have learned to perceive. We want to challenge that perception and see how we can mobilize a dynamic account of space, a space that is emerging from movement, that can be radically transformed through how we perform, how we move, how we relate. So how can we generate a very dynamic account of space, which is also challenging now trying to challenge, because of course surveillance and, surveillance and control are also pointing nowadays to um, novel emerging ideas of interactive <coughs> architecture. So I mean, all our big data systems and so on, they are more and more embedded into immersive concepts of architecture, which is ultimately what has been shaping our perception for millennia now. Um, so that again, the mainstream tendency in that direction is uh, interactive architecture as a control environment that is able to anticipate our desires, to just let us not move at all, just open the window when it detects that we want to open it, and things like that. It's a broad spectrum of things that are being researched into. I don't want to be redacted about it, but I think there's a very strong direction to increasing the way in which architecture already has been operating as a control system for centuries. Um, so, we want to counterbalance this with a very different experimentation. How could an interactive, ar an interactive architecture be focusing or proposing quite the opposite and opening up towards greater degrees of indeterminacy in the whole ecosystem relations? 
How could that be possible? How to do it? How, what could come out of that? Open questions for experimentation. Um, and so this is the, the co-organizers, so the coordinator and the project. We have 11 co-organizers from European uh, countries, and then this is the associated partners, amongst which you see Berkeley. Uh, so let's try to go into these questions. Uh, uh, how could embodiment be a response to global surveillance culture? Uh, well, I want to raise questions about how is it that the body can always or is always exceeding any, any way of trying to measure it or reduce it to a number of traceable parameters. How is any kind of measurement always partial? Therefore, um, how can in any instance, for example, if one is being analyzed by a camera or wearing a sensor, how is that always leaving out infinite number, an infinity of infinity of possibilities of measurement? How is that always necessarily the case? It's not just a question of increasing the power of a number of sensors or or um, or the capacity to process data. So this is an important question for me. It's not a, it's not a question of increasing the amount. It's not a quantitative problem. It's a qualitative problem. For example, how to interpret uh, an emotion or a gesture, an expression. For me, there's uh, an important... It's, this is, of course, very... Feel free to, to disagree strongly. I don't know. This is a, but an idea which I am throwing to the project, and which is not easy for all the partners, actually, uh, is that in any situation, such as this one, for example, what uh, to me makes uh, conversation interesting in terms of the nonverbal aspect, which for me actually the verbal is part of the nonverbal, it's also always about movements and affections of different kinds. But to me, makes a conversation interesting is not the capacity that I have to reproduce in my abstract mind the disembodied pattern that someone is projecting from his or her abstract mind. So I don't believe in any of these categories abstract mind, disembodied pattern, and so on. What I find interesting in a conversation is how I am creatively affected by the affects that the body is uh, projecting. So that's something always in between. There's a relational process in which I am being affected in unforeseeable ways by forces. Literally, affects are forces that affect and are affected. So how is the conversation always an affective process of affecting and being affected? And how can that be a creative process? which involves the yeah, unforeseeable as a positive value. Now for me, the fact that I can never fully know that there is in fact no single way to interpret a gesture of yours, an expression of yours, or that each of you I know is for sure interpreting my gestures and my language in different ways, in ways that perhaps not even you can foresee, because maybe some of what I'm saying will come up in your mind uh, in two days, and then some idea will sparkle or whatever. So how all these processes happen in the foreseeable ways for me is a as, um, fundamental aspect of understanding communication as a creative process. For me, the idea that communication is about transmission of pre-existing patterns is a dead model of communication. Mm -hmm. The dream state, what I would call a platonic tradition, that is placing, that is trying to fix reality into into patterns, immobile patterns, and placing truth in those immobile patterns. We're still largely in such a tradition. Although things have become much more complicated with information and cybernetics, and I will go to So let's say that power uh, and its operations following Foucault and so on, in a disciplinary society, so 17th, 18th, 19th century, and up to perhaps the birth of information in cybernetics in the middle of the 19th century has been largely, one could say, a question of repetition of patterns, patterns of movement, patterns of behavior, patterns of relation in bodies. A process which I associate to the birth of uh, imperial formations. Right? So how can one understand the, the rise uh, in different places of the planet of imperial formations in terms of perceptual aggregates, so ways in which the bodies have related to one another and have 
then um, how have issues of architecture of uh, um, the city of uh, how have all these elements been part of uh, what I would call a perceptual engineering? How perception has been organized or has self-organized into these totalizing structures that empires have been. We're still in that tradition, right? So it's, I'm just trying to situate this historically. It's, it's quite young in terms of the age of the Earth, quite old in terms of our age. So until, perhaps, right, this is all quite complex, but perhaps until the middle of the 20th century, power was so operating in terms of repeating totalizing patterns, like platonic patterns, like immobile forms, whereby in the Platonic tradition, truth is in those immobile forms. Now, something I've been researching into the last couple of years is how did that thought, that thought of uh, form is immobile and truth is related to that immobility, <coughs> that happened possibly around 2,500 years in, in Greece. There was a triple turn with Parmenides, Plato, and Aristotle, which form came to the foreground. Form was related even then to a particular kind of visual perception. And in fact, I would, kind of, I would like to ask you whether you can possibly think the idea of form without a certain connotation of visual perception. Mm. Form as a visual shape. Is it possible to really think it outside that? Even if you think of mm, sonic forms or whatever, can you really think form without <coughs> reference to kind of visual shape of any kind. In any case, in the, in the Greek tradition, it is linked to a dominant visual perception. So there we have already a tradition which is establishing very strict hierarchies of the senses. It's choreographing perception in very strict ways. And this happens through a very multi-layered and complex process. Geometry, architecture, how geometry shapes architecture, how in, in Greece goods became increasingly abstract in this trading of the Aegean Sea, which was quite unprecedented at the time, how money came into the picture, how there was this then increasing abstraction of the affordance, suddenly abstract affordances of money, of goods, money. How does all that relate to also language becoming more and more abstract, which is where Clendid is comes in with, with this term. So what I'm trying to suggest is that the idea the ideas that were formulated in philosophy at the time were for the first time, possibly ever, the idea of uh, a divide between an, a disembodied, immobile intellect and a world of the senses in the body and movement emerged. That came from a whole set of alignments of movements of the bodies in, in the period. And it wasn't there before, which is interesting to think. So in pre-Socratic, pre parmenidian philosophy, it's hard to find possibility, I mean, to think. What, I don't think you can find the thought that there was anything else than movement, for instance, which is what I'm kind of trying to go back to, or forwards to, in terms of ontology, ontology of movement. We are used to thinking movement as an external accident of a pre-existing thing. This is what has been taught yes. by this tradition, the Platonic, the Aristotelian tradition, the mechanistic, the mechanical tradition. What about thinking the reverse, as pre-Platonic might have thought? Movement as the only ontological substrate of the world, as some physics nowadays might think. And eventually thingness emerges from perceptual processes of movement. Eventually matter even arises from ways of Organization of movement. So not movement of something pre-human, but movement of movement, and from that movement, eventually, different processes emerge. And that's, of course, it's, it requires a certain um, squeezing of uh, the way we, we normally think, um, but it's certainly what I'm proposing for the body is a very crucial issue, which involves rethinking movement of so how can we um, rethink and re-experience movement in a way different from one we have learned within this tradition that teaches us oh movement is just an external accident of things, you pre-exist movement. How can we um, 
exceed that process. Well, I think we can try to discuss it now in the conversation. But the other thing I wanted to mention, I was saying that perhaps until the mid of the 20th century, power was operating in terms of repeating patterns, these platonic patterns that were truthized, truth lying, immoral patterns, the rest being an illusion, right? This is the platonic Christian rationalistic tradition. Yes? Now, what happens with the birth of information? Because I think that a crucial ontological turn in the operations of power happened then. Well, if you follow <coughs> the way Wiener describes cybernetics, it's of course a science of control. Let's call it what it is. Controlology would be a more or less optimistic term, mm -hmm. a term for cybernetics, right? Controlology. Um, as this modulating, modular kind of network that is able to adapt itself to the systems it's trying to control. So, power suddenly is no longer just a question of imposing pre existing patterns, which are anyway modulating this time, but the control network is something modulating that is adapting itself constantly through feedback processes which happen through our interfaces nowadays, for example, and through all the big data processing that is coming behind. Um, so there's this network which is constantly adapting itself to the emergent qualities of, of the movement of reality, because of course in the 20th century we no longer had this Newtonian idea of a, of a deterministic world, that there was all these new concepts of them probabilistic world of a world that was unforeseeable and complex and so on. So in that picture is where Wiener and Shannon come in with the, the notions of cybernetic and, and the, the particular uh, mathematical theory of information that, uh, that came through because there were others at the time. Now, how is information theory described by Shannon as a bodiless fluid? A bo again, it's a reinstation of the somatophobic tradition, the platonic somatophobic tradition. The idea of bodiless fluids, of patterns that are divorced from body, context, and meaning even. While there were other mathematical theories at the time that were trying to bring meaning, for example, into the picture of information. So we're still largely part of a, a way of abstracting information from the body, from the context, from even the meaning, as a bodiless fluid. Again, this is some other folly. Why this this um, this despise this continuous millennia long despise for the body? Well, in this tradition, body has been always linked with becoming, with emergence, with movement, with the senses, with the complexity that is part of all that. Uh, and a certain kind of fear has been engineered against that complexity. Right? Uh, a fear I don't believe in. Right? Uh, I don't believe in any universal kind of uh, principle that says, oh, you must have something very secure at hand in order to satisfy your human fears. I think a certain fear for the amorphous has been infused by the platonic tradition. Right? So, um, reversing cybernetics then would imply dealing, me, this implies dealing with many of those enormous questions that have deep ontological implications, perceptual implications, all kinds. And this is what Menabody is trying to address, which of course is paradoxical, is complex, uh, because ultimately the idea of indeterminacy, which I'm trying to propose, has to do precisely with how to, instead of trying to develop ecologies of control, as nowadays is the case mostly, that and the other, how, how do we assume uh, these qualities of control as kind of inevitable and so on and so forth? We're trying to kind of explore <coughs> the, the, the other end of the spectrum. What about if we try to generate ecologies of relations in which rather than trying to control or be controlled, we're trying to infuse greater degrees of indeterminacy <coughs> once we are part of at the moment, which implies then analyzing what kinds of determinacies we are part kinds of alignments, what, what multi-layered um, plethora of alignments we're part of in terms of gender constructs of power, relations of 
of the way we relate to space, of how, of how perception, and let me just show one last picture. Um, this is one of the crucial moments, the birth of perspectival vision in the Renaissance, which is still part of this paradigm. Uh, you see, it's a, it's a paradigm of fixation perception. So, for instance, the Greeks, we have this uh, categorization, the split of the senses that Aristotle performs, uh, the hierarchy of the senses with vision on top, and now here we have a very, very precise choreography of vision. So the defining senses splitting them, hierarchies of senses, and then the choreography of it. This is a fixation, perceptual fixation machine, where the painter must fix literally his hair into a grid. I think this is what generated the Cartesian split between subject and object 200 years before it was formulated in philosophy, materialized it, really, perceptually. This has an ontological force, a very deep one. We're still immersed uh, in this paradigm of rationalization of vision. In fact, all our interfaces are still operating on that ground, but they are capturing any other thing, not just visual data, any kind of sensor that is displayed in the whole planet or outside it, we know, is captured in that measuring machine in complex ways, in feedback systems, in systems that are not just about modulating with regards to the actual changes, but even to the potential changes, which is then again a crucial, crucial turning power. Now with big data, with just computing and so on, it's often, mostly even, about trying to preempt the virtual, the potential, what is not yet there, potential consumer, potential terrorist, right? Not just how can you be an actual consumer according to your actual desires, but what will be your potential desires so that we can anticipate them and preempt them. So this is all part of the modulating system of big data. We are now starting a series of events in a group with Metawari called Big Data Brother. So we will send out information on this, trying to understand the ontological foundations of data, big data, and so on. And okay, so of course in Metawari we, we are interested in kind of not just changing the context, the, sorry, the, the um, content of what's been happening inside the window, the perspectival window for 500 years, but undo the whole perceptual apparatus and see what happens. Thank you. So, thank you. Mm -hmm. Question?